I'm thrilled that uh, David is here to, uh, to, to talk to us. So just by way of introduction, you know, as we've all come to know in 2020, epidemiologists are the rock stars of 2020. The 1980s U2, the late 90s Michael Jordan, the Beyonce of the new decade. So we're very lucky to have David Walter Taves just here with us now to cheer us up with discussion on plagues, pandemics, viruses, and disease. Um, actually, you know, as, as Kathy and, and Sean mentioned, David has written a book that is full of wisdom, history, and science, and that is also a very compelling read, a real page turner. He's such a great storyteller. This book was first published in 2007, but quickly updated to include what we are now facing with the COVID-19 pandemic. David Walter Taves is an epidemiologist, a veterinarian, a specialist in epidemiology of food and waterborne diseases, zoonosis, I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah, he's an expert in that, so how disease is transmitted from animals to humans. He's lived and worked all around the world, and today we've reached him at his home in Kitchener to talk about on pandemics. David, hello. Hello. Such a nice cheap topic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such an important one. And for all of the people that are listening right now, I just want to um, say we're going to get to your Q&A in about 40 minutes. So please find the Q&A button and start sending your questions in now because we'll have, uh, we'll have plenty of time to get them all uh, asked to David, hopefully, as many as we can. So David, you know, where to start uh, in, in, in this? Why don't we start right where we are now with COVID-19? Um, what do the next 12 months look like for us? Okay, you, you know, I, I'm a veterinary epidemiologist, the, the, the human epidemiologist, if you want, start when, um, when somebody comes to the hospital door and they get sick and then they start transmitting it. I usually start before that. So looking ahead, um, if I'm just looking at this virus, it's a very, um, it's a, I was going to say a perfect virus for this time. It's managed to evolve in such a way that it, it doesn't have one clinical manifestation, right? So when we had SARS, you had respiratory disease, people were coughing, you could isolate them, you know who's got it. With this one, you have two people who are infected, one person dies, the other person walks away, doesn't even know they're infected. So this virus is uh, is unusual that way, but it turns out that from an evolutionary perspective, if you take the long view, it's a great way for a virus to survive because it's hard to pin it down, say, this is what it looks like in people, so this is what we can do. It makes it harder to isolate, which means we're, um, we're going to have to live with this. Whether or not we get a vaccine, which I'm not sure we will, it, you know, we probably will, but who knows how long the it will last. You get a vaccine, does it last two months, three months? Does the, uh, does the virus uh, mutate? Because these viruses are unstable, right? So we're entering a phase where we're, there's going to be a new normal, if you want. We're going to have to reinvent our society the way we do things, uh, everything. So I, oh, that's the clearest ever. answer. Well, I, at least until um, my grandchildren are around, I guess, you know, our lifetimes. Um, I think because we, it was such an unexpected um, pandemic. I mean, every, we predicted it, right? I say we collectively, epidemiologists, we, people were saying this, but it was a little bit like saying, well, there's going to be an earthquake on the West Coast, or there's going to be a volcano in the Philippines. Yeah, but to say that, now this is going to happen i think it caught people off guard simply because it's not you know people have been watching contagion and there are people dying in the streets everywhere so let me just pick up on that david when you talk about it being predictable and you talk about this in your book you said we have known for many years what needs to be done to prevent pandemics yeah. so why haven't we acted is the question you ask how would you answer that um, well, there were a lot of other things going on, right? I mean, people, we get distracted. There are all the political things going on, economic. And because the, the, the situation we've been in has benefited a lot of people. So we went to 
um, economies of scale brought the price of food down. Lots of food production, people have jobs, uh, employment rates going up, everything seems to be fine. And so to say, well, something is, you know, a pandemic's going to come and it's going to be serious. We don't know how serious. We don't know exactly when it's going to come. It's pretty hard for someone in government to say, well, let's set aside a bunch of money in order to address something that might or might not happen within my tenure as, as prime minister or president, and it might or might not be serious. Uh, so I, I'm not, I don't fault people for getting caught off guard. Just, can you describe that a little bit more for us? You call it a perfect storm of animal disease, and you touched on right. it there when you re referenced economies of scale. But you make the case in your book that there are so many elements going into right. how we got to where we are today. Just broaden that for us a little bit, if you will. Okay. Um, I'll go back a little bit further than I did in the book. There's a disease called African swine fever, which was originally came out of Africa, and it was the Europeans brought it, uh, another disease there, and it got transmitted into Europe. 2018, this disease got into China, beginning of 2018. And it came either from Russia or from Europe or from Africa, nobody's quite sure, and of course, everybody denies it. But what happened in 2018, 2019 was that half the pigs in China died or were killed to try to prevent the spread of this disease. It's a serious disease of pigs, doesn't affect, um, uh, doesn't affect people. So 200 million pigs dead. Um, at the same time, there were uh, uh, outbreaks of uh, bird flu. So half the chickens in some of these farms died. Again, it's not a disease that's, that's been spread around as a pandemic among people. And then you're coming up to Chinese New Year. So you've got tens of millions of people. They're looking for food. They're going to have a big dinner. They're traveling around. They come to the markets. There aren't any pigs. The chickens aren't that many chickens. So what do you do? So the people in the markets are selling what they've got, right? So they're selling wildlife, they're selling other kinds of meats, which is the same thing any entrepreneur would do anywhere in the world. You could argue that it wasn't that well regulated, but you know, that's in retrospect. Um, and so you have all of these things happening at once. And then all you needed was all these people coming together. You've got different species, you've got the viruses, which have probably been circulating for a while in that area because they weren't selling bats there. They weren't even selling the animals that they think were the ones that had it before it got to people. They weren't, there weren't pangolins there. So we're looking at, at different species. So it's probably been circulating. And then we've got this storm of all of these things happening. And then you have a virus which transmits easily, doesn't have a clear presentation. And so people are caught off guard. Mm. Uh, you just you mentioned pangolins there. I'll just uh, just in case people don't know the sort of the scaly anteater that is really that's one of the highly most highly trafficked animals in the world okay. illegally, yeah. right? And there's some thought that maybe the virus <clears throat> came to us from them. But David, what would you say about wet markets? I mean, there was a lot of conversation about wet markets in Wuhan early on in this pandemic. Right. Where does that all fit into this discussion and the origin of, of this? I mean, a, a wet market is one term for a, a, a fresh farmer's market, if you want. I mean, the ones in Southeast Asia are more crowded and busier than the ones we have here, but they have fresh meat and fresh vegetables. We, everybody wants to have fresh. That's the other thing that's happened is that the people who market food say, you, you know, want to have it fresh, we sell the freshest food in town. Well, that means something different in each culture. And in Chinese culture, it means it, it's alive when you buy it, <coughs> right? And then they, they either kill it in front of you at a restaurant, which I've seen, or you take it home, you kill it yourself. And so you've got live animals and they're more likely to transmit the disease there. But we have, I mean, you, you look at what happened here with the slaughterhouses, you have outbreaks in slaughterhouses, you've got people working in close quarters, you've got meat there. Maybe you don't have vegetables, but you've got this transference of, of viruses and bacteria in close quarters. So that would be the wet market. I think the, the, what's different maybe in China is they've got more than a billion people, right? If we had the same thing, we have the same kinds of markets here, we wouldn't have maybe the same problems we have because we don't have that many people crowded together in one place. But when we are trying to figure out where the virus started and how it yep. made the jump to humans, yes. what, is, what is that 
series of events. I mean, did it start with a bat? Was it the pangolin? Just take us through that and what we know. It probably started with a bat. We know there are some serious viruses that bats carry around and we've known this since late 80s, early 90s. There was a disease in, in Malaysia called Nipah virus, which was the basis of the movie Contagion when, you know, dead people in the streets and so on. It was a really serious disease. It came from bats who were feeding on mango trees around pig farms and then they were pooping in the pig farms. The pigs got sick, the people got sick, and like 40, 50% of the people died. That was contained. But at that point, uh, researchers and many of my colleagues who are doing wildlife epidemiology started looking at bats and saying, well, they've got all these other viruses. We know probably Ebola in Africa and, and maybe some of these other viruses are a problem. So how it got from the bats into other species, like maybe a pangolin, um, is we don't know because it, it, the, the trafficking of wildlife, nobody's really tracking that. Where the bats are hanging out, um, they, fly around, they fly around, right? And they hang from the trees, flying foxes. They, they migrate around Southeast Asia. So they could be carrying it various places. They could be in fruit orchards where there are animals uh, foraging around on the ground. And so those other animals pick it up. Somebody gets those animals, they take it to market and we eat those. And then in the market, that's where the people get exposed. Okay, okay. You know, uh, I mean, one of the things that you paint so clearly here is, is, is the, the perfect storm of am, animal disease, as you say, um, economies of scale and global trade and the role that that is playing in pandemics. There's an example you use about chicken. You talk about the exponential growth in the number of chickens that we are yeah. raising and eating, like mm -hmm. exponential growth. Why is that such a dangerous thing for humans? What does that mean and what does that represent? Okay, I'll give you the positive side first. The reason we went there is you have economies of scale. You have more chickens in one place, your capital costs are lower, the price at the grocery store is lower, and so more people can afford to buy chicken. Right? So this has been a long-standing dream. You know, a chicken in every pot. It goes back to 1400 to Henry IV of, of France. And Tommy Douglas. <laughs> All of those, right. Yes. And so here is a way that this was delivered. So we went down that road the, it was seen primarily as an economic way to bring food to the masses, if you want. To. Everybody could go and eat chicken. Good source of low-fat protein. <clears throat> what it also, what it misses, however, is that those chickens have their own microbiomes. That's what we talk about now. They, they weren't talking about those, you know, even 20 years ago, 15 years ago that there are all these uh, microbes, viruses, fungi living in and around chickens. You crowd them together. The more you crowd them, the more likely they are to shed, so whether it's salmonella or whether it's some other virus, you know, uh, avian influenza. You take them into a, if you can control it at the farm, which they have by what they call biosecurity, you wear a hazmat suit to go into a chicken barn nowadays. It goes to the slaughterhouse and there it can be transferred between the chickens and from the chickens to the people that are working there because you've got such a huge volume of animals coming through. And so it's the other way to solve that problem of a chicken in every pot. One way is to say, let's put it all on the production end and say the farmers, if they have big farms, produce a lot, brings the price down. Great. If we have smaller farms, smaller slaughterhouses, we don't have to go back to um, you know, subsistence living. I'm talking about something in between, you know, family-sized farms, if you want. Um, it increases the cost. And anybody that tries to get organic or local realizes that the price goes up. Well, then poor people can't afford to buy it. So what do you do? One of the ways is to go back to economies of scale. The other way is to say is, well, that's an economic problem maybe something like a guaranteed income or some sort of an other way to, to have people have a, a sufficient income in order to pay for their food is a way to address it as an economic issue rather than simply as a, as a biological farmer's issue. And then it takes the pressure off the farming systems and distributes it, but it's really hard.